So great a cloud of witnesses. Where was that statement made and what does it have reference to? Open your Bibles, if you would, to Hebrews chapter 12. We're going to talk a little bit about chapter 11 because that's where the subject is fixed. It states there in the first verse of that 11th chapter of uh, Hebrews, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for. Really, it's confidence or a deed, to be more specific in the Greek. It's your deed of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. In other words, things not seen, what does that mean? Well, it means your father does some things that he doesn't expect the world to see. Why? Because this is a probation period for people to make their mind up whether they're going to follow God or somebody else. So naturally, God depends on those that understand the earth ages, the fact that there's more dimensions than one. What do you mean by more dimensions than one? Well, if something's in another dimension, your chances of seeing it are pretty slim. Well, do you think, what are you talking about? Well, the Holy Spirit. We'll start with the Holy Spirit. Um, we'll even give an example of when one was out on a hill, Elisha overlooking, he had one person with him. He said, let's go whip that army. He said, Whoa, hoss, wait a minute, there's just two of us. And then he prayed and said, Father, if you would, open that cloud, or rather, open that veil so he can see who's with us. And there was a whole army there. Man, I mean chariots, whistles, trumpets, bells. There was so much noise that that army made that was unseen by them that it frightened a bunch of the enemy to death. Well, I'm telling you. So, you see, your deed is your hope that those things you can't see are there with you. I mean, can you handle that? Well, I'm never alone. And then a person will get out in a bad place. I'm all by myself. No, you're not. You're absolutely not. If, you know, there's a, in that word a big old word, big, only two letters, but that is one of the biggest words in the Bible, if. If you believe, you're not alone. Now, absolutely, God expects you to have enough common sense that you don't go alone in a place where you can take enough physical leverage along with you to take care of whatever might come up. Okay, that's just common sense. But you see, we're not warring in these end times against flesh and blood only. We're warring against other powers as it is written in Ephesians chapter 6. Well, can I see those powers on high? Not with flesh eyes. You can't. Have you got spiritual eyes? That's eyes to see. To see that that is hoped for. That is to say to believe it enough that you know it's real. So, sometimes if you think you're all alone, you've got the whole world to... Think about old Elijah... Oh, God, they've killed all your prophets and I'm left here all alone. Just take me to, you know. Even he, you know, don't, don't ever be that way. Because he's given, you live, in a, you live in a generation of the fig tree where all these things that were before are a witness to you that you can trust. You can count on him. Whether you can see him or not. I know all of you have felt him. If you felt him, that should be proof enough to you that he's real. So, what's the big deal in these people that say, if, if I just could believe? or well, if I could just be sure? Well, they've never read God's word. That's all there is to it. There's no excuse. For our Father is always with us. And there is always a great cloud of witnesses that are with us. But, well, who were those witnesses? Well, we could start reading there, but we're not. We'd hear about Enoch. I mean, Enoch was such a good um, uh, prophet, 
prophesier, he was a teacher. All right? You'll find that documented in the great book of Jude, if you need proof of it. He was a prophet. And he, he was telling them, you better stop messing around with these Nephilim, fallen angels, or God's going to strike you. Well, he was so perfect that God just took him. He, did, he, he uh, transfigured him much as he did Christ. And um, he, why? He had faith. He knew that God was there. And then he went on with the long list. Abraham, Sarah. I mean, there's Sarah, 90 years old. And said, you're going to have a baby. She said, <laughs> She broke out in laughter, and that's why they called the lad Isaac, because it means laughter, you see. But when she realized, I mean, I think probably in her case, she... She had wanted a child so bad that part of that wasn't doubt. It was happiness. You know, she was glad. You know, because when God stated, she believed. Why? She had faith. And on and on it goes down through to Moses. How could Moses cross that desert without knowing God was with him? And then end up in the land of Kenites where Heber had those lovely daughters and uh, had their sheep there, though they were Abraham's children by Keturah, called the Midianites. And he married one of them. They were, again, Abraham's children by Keturah. Genesis 25 documents that for us. And, but he knew, he had faith. And he would climb that mountain, and there was that cloud again. And finally, in Paul's teachings in this um, 11th chapter of Hebrews, he said, And there were others, even mothers or women given back their dead. That has to do with Elijah. The fact that Elijah, he that was transfigured also, that left in that whirlwind, didn't die. Um, had faith to bring, knowing that God would hear him and give life to that mother's child, you know. As a, as a witness to us. So we have all kinds of witnesses. All kinds of proofs. To substantiate your deed whereby you know you're in good hands. When you're in God's hands. Because he is with you. And each one of those I mentioned plus many others written there. Are witnesses with you. Witnesses to what? That Christ is Messiah. God is on the throne. And as we in this generation, the generation of the fig tree, of all people that ever needed to be aware of that witness, you should. Because you're going to need it. You need that assurance. You need to know you're not alone. And you need to know that a witness who is a witness for God that is educated and well-founded in the Word of God is useful to him. If you're not, I'm sorry, I'd get started. I really would. To find out what the Word of God was all about and why it is that some people have eyes to see and some don't. Some have ears to hear, some don't. They don't understand the Word. In the simplicity in which Christ taught it, the three world ages, to understand the clarity of overcoming in this earth age. It's so easy putting on his yoke because the yoke, number one, makes the load easy to bear. He is that yoke, so actually he carries it for you. Or he can do the other way. He can load your wagon down to where you're not going to get ahead in this life. You're going to be kind of a get-by person. Or you could have God's blessings. It's so amazing to me the choice is so simple. I find it difficult to understand why some people choose to butt their heads against a brick wall when the truth sets you free. You know, for six, what does it set you free to do? Not from, but to do. To be successful. To be somebody. To be helpful to God. To be in that group of witnesses that are able to take forth truth on our brethren that have no truth, on our brethren that don't have the whole picture, that most likely will be deceived, 
Okay, I want to pick it up in verse 1 of chapter 12. Having said that, so we have the subject fixed, so we know who these witnesses are that are being discussed. Chapter 12, book of Hebrews, Paul teaching it. Verse 1. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about. Now think about that. Don't read over it. They're all around you. With so great a cloud of witnesses. Well, who is he talking about? We just discussed it. It's in chapter 11. All right? The chapter on faith. That's the witnesses we're talking about. They're, it's written. It's recorded. And they're there. A great cloud of witness. Let us lay aside every weight. That's to say any clothing or anything that might slow you down. Moffat, I think, even translates it folds, you know. That's why people girded themselves when men wore skirts like some of you ladies do today. And, um, uh, and, this, and the sin which doth so easily beset us, that's to say slow us down, and let us run with patience. That means endurance. Do you know how you run with endurance? You work out. You exercise. I'm not talking, exercise physically, that's good for you, but also in God's Word. Exercise your belief or you're not going to have any, really. Okay? In other words, you've got to put it to the test. I don't have to worry about you putting it to the test. You're put to the test every day in this world. In one form or the other. Uh, so the endurance, uh, run with endurance the race that is set before us. This term has to do with the Olympics. And I thought this was very befitting because we're in the time of the Olympics. And we see young people just with pain put themselves forth as they strive for the mark. And certainly we ourselves should strive in his word among those witnesses, to be familiar enough that we're a fit hand to do God's work. And uh, I don't think there's too many of you out on a job that hire an unfit hand. I wouldn't want one. All he's going to do is slow down the rest of the crew, get in the way. You know? Well, that's kind of the way God is in using people. He really does. Now, it's one thing to be saved, but I'm talking about workers. I'm talking about witnesses. I'm talking about people that God can bless and they will be useful to him. All right? Um, I know that Paul spoke colloquial Greek. And I know that he uses the word cloud here. as it, 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 It's a large group. He didn't mean a cloud off in the sky. It's a figure of speech. All right? He studied and was a Hebrew scholar. Now, this is the same cloud that he would speak of in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, all right? Same kind of way. But there's something, you know, have you ever heard of the great mystery of God that Paul would bring forth? You see, um, even within that, though he spoke street Greek, he was educated in Hebrew, so cloud to him meant what it means in Hebrew, and basically it's the same thing. However, the etymology of the word is to cover or to hide something. Hide what? That that you can't see. Okay, so, see, we're going to a little deeper level here, and I want you to latch on to that. The prime of the word anin, A-N-A-N, very simple in the Hebrew. I'll say it again, A. N A N, emphasis on the last N. A nun. A nun. Uh, it means a covert act. That's the prime. It means not to the negative in God's sense, certainly, but to the positive. Why do you say covert? Well, that's the prime of the word. I didn't say it. That's what it means. It means not everybody sees it. That's what a covert act is is something going on that not everybody can understand. It doesn't need, mean necessarily that they're stupid in the world. They're just stupid about God's Word and God's acts. So anyway, study God's Word, and you can afford to believe. But know also that you're gathered in a group of witnesses that is a covering, that has a program, 
call it covert if you like. I don't mind. I kind of like good covert activity if it's God doing it, you know. That's the way he operates many times. Some might say, well, give me an example. Uh, That'd be a different subject for a different time. But what about Esau and Jacob? You know, God had already told uh, the mother, Sarah, hey, the younger is going to be the boss. The older is going to serve him. You got two nations in your tummy. All right. Now, according to the law, the firstborn, whom Esau was, is supposed to have it all. But God, using that woman and a brother, used some very covert activity to get the blessing on Jacob. All right? Don't, don't ever, you know, a lot of people would say, well, how crooked of those two. Wasn't crooked. God had already said it in Genesis 25 when the act took place in Genesis 20. Seven, I believe it was, eh? somewhere along. Yeah, that's right. I couldn't be wrong, could I? Possibly, but, you know, that's correct, okay? So, that's covert activity. So, don't think for a moment that a cloud that covers, take it back to the prime and use it. What I want you to know is that God, through that covering, expects more out of some people as far as their understanding. Him is concerned if... There's that word again. You got that deed in your hand. You know, that's your legal right to, and faith gives it to you for those things that are promised in God's word. Okay? Meaning a deed to them. They're yours. You know you've got a good place there. You know you've got reward there. Your faith is your deed to it. It's your guarantee. Your promise from God, and He never lies, that you're going to have it. So, with a witness gathered around you, in what dimension? Well, you figure it out. That the Father centers those upon those that try to run that race in those Olympics, and when you get tired, hey, there's plenty of help around. Call for it. I hope you understand what I'm talking about. I hope you wouldn't If you get in that kind of trouble, it's nice to have fellow workers, but I'm talking about a much higher calling than that. Those witnesses that have been there, those witnesses that know. Uh, And it's all written right there in front of you in God's Word, exactly how it came off, you know, how it went down. So it shouldn't be a surprise to you, should it? Really. He wrote you that letter a long time ago, and you should have read all of it by now and pretty well absorbed it. Because that's where you get your strength and your knowledge. The beginning of knowledge is to revere or love God. All right, Proverbs chapter 1. So if you want knowledge and if you want success and if you want peace of mind, that's where you find it. Otherwise, hey, keep batting the brick wall and see who cares. All right, that's your choice. It's a free world. And uh, I'm certainly not going to stop anyone from beating their head against a wall if that's what they choose. If that makes them happy, it takes all kinds, all right? But you, hang on to that deed. It's his letter to you that simplifies life, that simplifies success. Because the way you gain success is to please him. And he takes care of the rest of it. Otherwise, he'll take your bucket and he'll put so many holes in it that you're going to wear yourself out running back and forth as you're leaking all over the place. All right? Never getting anything done. It just seems like I can't keep up. Do you know that scriptural? I hope you do. It's Haggai chapter 1. An old man preacher. You know, he taught that a long time ago. So, that deed and those witnesses, though you can't see them, they're there. And they're real. Spiritually, they're with you. That's what he's saying here. Verse 2. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Do you want to know who the author of your faith is and who the finisher of it is? It's Jesus. He died so that your sins, though you fall short, could just be scrubbed off and gone. Never mentioned again. We all have to have that because none of us are perfect. You get one of these goody-goody two-shoes that says, I'm just so perfect, it's pitiful. 
It's like a man told me this morning, he said, my wife said I was perfect. She said I was a perfect heel, you know. Well, <laughs> that wasn't the word he used, but it'll do for the time being. You know, we were kidding, of course, you know. But anyway, we're not perfect, and we do fall short. And don't fall out of liking someone because they're not perfect, or you're not going to have any friends, all right? But that's what Jesus did for us. So that on believing upon him, we can just blot out those sins and not even mention them again. And that's the author, the finisher, and the beginning of your faith. Who for the joy that was set before him endured. Hey, he could do it. Endured the cross, despising the shame. And it set, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Did it say he was dead? No. Is he alive? Of course he is. And he is at the throne of God sitting on the mercy seat, which is what Satan tried to take away from him in Ezekiel chapter 28. You've read it as the king of Tyre. And for that, he's sentenced to death. That is to say, Satan, for trying to take that mercy seat. Well, you don't have to worry about him taking it now. Christ is sitting on it. So... That give, what does that mean to you? It means that the author of your faith is sitting at the right hand of God, so what are you worried about? You think he can't... If you're sitting beside somebody and you want their attention, what do you do? You say, hey, hey, hey Lord, see what they're doing to your boy or your girl down there. And he says, I'll take care of it. I'll fix it. And God help the soul that misleads or lies or, or mistreats one of God's servants, you know. He knows you're tough and he knows you can take it. You, he knows you're not a White House lily that you're going to fold up the first time somebody says something bad about you. Right? He knows you're a can-do type person. Why? You know the word. You know that he's going to take care of it ultimately. Maybe not that second. He's going to take care of it. You can count on it. You can put, if he, you know, I wonder how many would say, well, I wonder what Jesus was thinking that day as they were driving those spikes in his hands uh, as he was doing that for you. I wonder if he thought, ah, now let's not be hasty here. Let's put this off till tomorrow. <laughs> what do you say? What do you say next time we meet, I'll do it. <laughs> I, I'm not quite ready. He didn't do that. I mean, there was one specific time, instant, in time, on that Passover, that it was written that he must become that lamb. And God is always on time. Christ was always on time. That's why he can strengthen your faith to know he's always going to be there for you. He doesn't make idle promises. Okay? He's right there at the throne of God. Do you know something else? That's why in Matthew chapter 18, verse 10, you can rest assured when it says, your angel, if, that is if you have ears to hear, your angel has God's attention at any time that uh, he needs it. It has his face is what it says in the Greek, but that's what it means, his attention. What to help you? Verse 3. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself. And he was perfect. Man, if you think, look at the contradiction that he pulled, and here you're not perfect, do you think you're not going to have any? I mean, you know, if you're going to be a wet noodle, you may not have any contradiction. But if you're going to stand for anything, there's going to be some cluck that's going to, uh, that's a nice name, isn't it? You know what a cluck is. That's, a, that's cluck, 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 cluck. That's a ratchet jaw, you know, that's going to say something bad about you because, unfortunately, we're not perfect. He was. And if he can put it off and say, get it right next time, friend, that's all you got to say. Next, just give me one more chance. I'll show you how to get it done. Don't be a quitter, all right? So just wait. I may have messed up, but show me, let me have one more crack at it. I'm a can-do type person. I'll make it. All right? Because if anybody else in this world can, you can. You may not do it as well as they do the first time, but keep working on it. Don't give up. 
And you won't be there long. You'll come up in the world. God's blessings will be there for you. Uh, for that contradiction of sinners against himself, lest, or you could even translate this if, that big word again, you be wearied and faint in your minds. Oh, Lord, it's a rough life. Don't, don't ever, you know, you're, you're being had. You know, if, if, if it ever comes, if you ever come to that point where you just say, it just isn't worth it. That's Satan talking to you. That's not you talking. Oh, but it's just so bad. You know, I, I don't like wimps. And there's just one thing I dislike more than a wimp, and that's a poor me baby. Now, I, I know y'all don't know any poor me babies, and you don't know any wimps because you live among champions, all right? But I hate to, you know, it's just such a waste to see somebody throw it all away. That's what a wimp and a poor me baby does. They're wasting their lives. Instead of finding out what it is that makes them a wimp and do something about it and be a champion of God's people. Or a poor me baby, find out God's going to correct you. You better find out why he's got the stick out and say, yes, Lord. You know, but he can take, I have seen some people that he's taken to the woodshed for 40 years and they still don't know. They just get up and crawl back to the woodshed and then they get up from there and go back bloodied old head and go back to doing what they were doing. And, and God wants them or he wouldn't keep correcting them. <clears throat> Never faint, all right? I'm speaking spiritually now, all right? Four, ye have not yet resisted unto blood striving against sin. Now think about that. Christ did. I mean, when they hit him with the spikes... And that old sword through the side before that day was over. He bled. And he bled for you. That's the blood that forgives your sins. That washes them white as snow. When you start whimpering and whining, it's really rough. Oh, well, you haven't even started yet. You know? All this roughing you up is people in the world. And if you're not smarter than they are, well, poor you. You know? You've you got to learn to use your head. And this is what teaches you how is God's Word. How to be successful. How to be a can-do type person. Okay? And um, because Christ, I mean, He shed blood. It was dangerous to be a Christian then. I mean, they, fled, they fed some people to lions even. Kind of tough being Christians. I don't know if I want to go to church today. I don't know if I want... Church won't save you, all right? It's this Word that saves you. I don't know if I want to read God's Word today or not. Well, you should if you're free and you can because there's some people in this world that would almost have to hide a Bible to possess one and still be successful in their way of life, communities. As a matter of fact, some of the countries we're fighting for and uh, perhaps I shouldn't say this, they can't even take a Bible with them. You know, it's kind of sad, isn't it? They're willing for our boys and girls to lay their blood down for them, but they don't want their religion there. Don't want Christ there. Well, that's a different story for a different time. Verse 4. You have, um, we, we got that. Okay, verse 5. And you have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. If God's, you know, do you know what that means? If God still will rebuke you, you might have had big plans and man, your airbag got flattened. Psh, I mean, you were shot right out of the saddle. That might have been God saying, that's not what I told you to do. So don't, don't faint just because, pray about it. Say, Father, where have I gone wrong? Is there something else you want me to do? Because uh, the Lord, uh, my son, despise not thou ch the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when you're rebuked of him. Six, for whom the Lord loveth, and let this sink in real good. The witnesses will witness it for you. 
For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. There's no gender in that. That means children. So if God corrects you, it means he still loves you. If he doesn't correct you, and it's just easier and easier for you to go to hell, you know, he's kind of maybe he said, hey, let him go to the devil until he can get his act together. I, don't know. I can't use him that way. So he, he just, but as long as God corrects you, you can know that he still loves you, but most sincerely, he also wants you. He needs you. Oh, we'll make it without you if we have to. But he could sure use you, or he would not be talking to you for the fulfillment of his overall plan in this generation of the fig tree. He'd sure like to have you there. So that's why he keeps dealing with us even when we do fall short. What a cloud of witnesses. Turn with me to Rev the great book of Revelation. We're just going to let our minds absorb perhaps some of what's happening, what's going on. Maybe some of those things we don't see. That our faith gives us the deed to maybe perhaps understand if we exercise our minds just a little bit. Thinking of that cloud and the things not seen, listen to this with that thought foremost in your mind. Chapter 10, great book of Revelation. Chapter 10, the great book of Revelation, verse 1. And I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven, clothed with a cloud. I repeat, he was clothed with a cloud. He was covered with it. That possibly means not everybody could see him. And a rainbow upon his head and his face was as it were the sun and his feet as pillars of fire. Boy, this certainly wasn't one of the seven. Okay. We're talking about a much higher official than one of the seven angels. But there he is. He's clothed in a cloud. Again, what does that mean in the Hebrew? Something covered is the prime. Something working, something being done. Verse 2, And he had in his hand a little book open, and he set his right foot upon the sea, and his left foot upon the earth. 3, And he cried with a loud voice, as when a lion roareth. He wasn't one of these sweet talkers, all right? He let it go. And when he had cried, seven thunders uttered their voices. Not trumpets, not vials, not seals, seven thunders. Four. And when the seven thunders had uttered their voices, I was about to write, and I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered, and write them not. In other words, they're not written in here. The trumpets are. But what does thunder mean to you? Where does it come? Is thunder harmful? Uh-uh. It might scare you sometime, but it isn't the thunder that's dangerous. It's the lightning that caused it, okay? In other words, if you have to wait till you hear the thunder, what does that mean? Sorry, Charlie, it's too late. Something got the dickens knocked out of it just down the road there a piece, you know? And you're the last one to get the word. So God doesn't want you to learn that way, okay? If you have to learn that way, I'm sorry, it's too late already for you. And that just isn't the case, and that's the message, all right? And we continue on then with verse, uh, four, uh, with, uh, verse 5. And the angel which I saw stand upon the sea and upon the earth, lifted up his hand to heaven. What's he going to do? 6. And swear by him that liveth forever and ever. Who created, who created heaven and the things that therein are, and the earth and the things that therein are, and the sea and the things which are therein, that there should be time no longer. What are we talking about? Time in this dispensation, meaning you're about to face your maker. Time's running out. Seven. But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, 
Whoa, who's the voice of the seventh angel? The seventh trump. That's when the second advent takes place. You know that. When he shall begin to sound the mystery of God, that covert activity in a very good sense, should be finished as he hath declared to his servants the prophets. Your prophets are your witnesses. Have they whispered in your ear? Have you read them with understanding? They are your witness. That's God speaking through them. For Jesus, the living word, is the author and the finisher of your faith, which again is what your deed, your guarantee that God's word is true to you and that his blessings will flow on you. When you get hope to that deed, you hang on to it. Don't let anybody hanky with it. That's your success you're dealing with, not only here, but forever and ever. And the voice which I heard from heaven spake unto me again and said, Go and take the little book which is open in the hand of the angel which standeth upon the sea upon the earth. You, you go get that book. You know what it was? It was a biblet, which is a Bible, meaning it was written within and without. Being full is what it means. It's a Bible. God's Word. Nine, and I went unto the angel and said unto him, Give me the little book. And he said unto me, Take it and eat it up. Now, did he say, Son, you take that home with you and you put it on the shelf and every time somebody kicks off the, kicks the bucket in your family, you write them down in there now here. Okay? Keep the record there. And if somebody gets lucky and a little in his birth, put them down in there too in the little book. No. He said, Eat it consume it, partake of it, okay? And he said unto me, take it and eat it up, and it shall make thy belly bitter, but it shall be in thy mouth, be in thy mouth sweet as honey. And it is. But God's word will cause a little bitterness in your tummy. Why? You're going you're gonna to get those sore heads out there. When you do it God's way, Satan's going to get somebody to get in your path. You surely wouldn't let that bother you, would you? You know, so you don't know what you're talking about. Well, I'm sorry, I do. I've read it in the Bible. You mean to tell me you believe that stuff? You know, that's right spewing from Satan's mouth. But I dare say there's not a person in this room that hasn't heard it from a human being. Sometime in their life, you've heard it. I mean, they're out there. I'm sorry. If they want to go to hell, let them go. All right? But you partake of the word. And maybe, just maybe, by the example you'll set forth, maybe old Satan will kick them around enough that someday they'll come back and say, Hey, how did your luck change so much? Because you see, there's no such thing as luck. Okay? I'm going to tell you about luck. You, you um, wish to be lucky in this hand, and you work real hard and come payday, see which hand is the fullest. Okay? I think that's the way that goes, something like that. Okay? But there's just no such thing as luck. The harder you work, and the more you use this, it makes the work all that much easier. The further ahead you're going to get. Because God says, that's my boy. That's my girl. Going to give them a little extra this week. A blessing. They just do me so proud. Because you know what? If we were to turn back to the fourth chapter in this great book of Revelation, the last verse, it would say there why he created you. I said you. For his pleasure. That's what it says. I don't know. Have you given him any pleasure lately? Well, I don't know. Well, why in the world would he want to bless you then? He would have no reason to bless you if you haven't given him any pleasure. Oh, what gives him pleasure? You learning what's here. And it's just as he's more natural than we are. When one of your children give you pleasure, what, how do you feel? Well, he feels the same way. And he expects the same thing. Like father, like son, like daughter, like child. <clears throat> I'm moving real slow through this. I thought I'd be through by now. And here we're just dragging along. But I, it, it's just so powerful that you see that mystery of the witnesses, all right? That 
That's history, all right, but there's nobody dead. They're still here. They're with the Father. And wherever the Father is, so are they, all right, the host. That's your guarantee. You're not alone. And it's important that you note that. And I took the little book out of the angel's hand, ate it up, and it was in my mouth, sweet as honey. And as soon as I had eaten it, my belly was bitter. I'm sorry, that's part of it, but that's what makes you different. That's why God can depend on you. And he said unto me, Thou must prophesy again before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. What does it mean before tongues? How many languages can you speak? That's what it means. Well, let me see. Now, how many? I could speak a little bit of several languages. But to really put God's word out, I can't. I, sometimes, some people say I can't even get it done too well in English, you know, because I got too many ain'ts and stuff like that. You know, it ain't so. And if I get excited or something like that, I revert back and, you know. So, what does that mean? I'm, I'm very serious now. It means the Pentecostal tongues. Oh. What were they? Well, you'll read of them in Acts chapter 2, verses 6 and 7. The evidence of the presence of the Holy Spirit that you'll be speaking in every language, tongue of the world. Nothing unknown about it. No gibberish. I mean, now this is biblical. Have you read the Bible? Acts chapter 2, verses 6 and 7 states that the Pentecostal tongue was understood by every ear that heard it. Not only understood, but it was in the same brogue and dialect as the county they were born. That's what you got to do, friend. That's what he says. Those that hear are going to... Why? You're going to be delivered up before the Antichrist, as it's written in Mark 13, and the Holy Spirit's going to speak through you. Are you up to it? Why couldn't you be? You don't have to do anything. Satan, all he's doing is holding the biggest revival this world will have ever seen, saying, I'm little Jesus, only he's a fake, and he's coming first. It's important that you know your Father's word. Turn with me to Psalms 104. Get back in the Old Testament here just a little bit. <clears throat> What a cloud of witnesses. Psalms 104, verse 1, and it reads, Bless the Lord, O my soul. O, o Lord my God, thou art very great. Why? He's your, he's your father. That's why. Thou art clothed with honor and majesty. In other words, everything about you, even your clothing, is honorable. Two, who coverest thyself with light as with a garment. Now I want you to remember when we see that word coverest, that's the prime of cloud, all right? Who stretcheth out the heavens like a curtain. I mean, it's nothing. Hey, stop and think a moment. If God can stretch out the heavens like a curtain, you think he can't hit, take care of your little old problems? Huh. Three who layeth the beams of his chambers in the waters, who maketh the clouds his chariot. He can put his chariot, chariot right in a cloud, and you're not going to see anything but a cloud if he so chooses. Who walketh upon the wings of the wind, the hurak, that spirit. Something you can't see. You can't see the wind unless it hits a plant and kind of blows it, or somebody's hair. For who maketh his angels spirits, hurak, the wind, his ministers a flaming fire. Now, if we were to have taken that 12th chapter of Hebrews, and we're not going to, the last verse in that chapter stipulates our God is a consuming fire. But it doesn't burn you. It's the touch of the Holy Spirit. It only burns the enemy. It has no effect on you other than his love, his kindness, his understanding. And the simple path that he has placed forth in this control. But each person must make his or her mind up as to how they intend to serve him or someone else. Why? Because all those that fell away in that first earth age, we don't want them with us in the third 
if they can't on their own want to do better because we don't want that third earth age, heaven, to be trouble. So how do you arrange that then? You get rid of the troublemakers, all right? It's just like in my cattle, if I go down and buy an old heifer that jumps the fence, she's going to get loaded right back up. Because You know why? Pretty soon all of them are jumping the fence. That old heifer is going to get loaded up. She's going back to the sale barn and she's out of here. Let somebody else worry with her. Or let, let her be in your uh, hamburger meat the next day, you know. Life is too short to put up with trouble, okay. You don't have to. Use this, all right. But now, I kind of hate to say it, but that's kind of what God intends to do, is to get rid of the troublemakers. So it's important that you try to please Him. Go with me to Exodus chapter uh, 13. I think about clouds, the covering. Exodus is where our children, were, the, God's children, were coming out of bondage. And it was all a great example of how He can protect you. And I want to pick up on verse 21 and 22 only. You all know the story at how he took care of them there. I mean, it was a rough old time, but he provided everything, food um, and even shelter. If you listen to this, listen to it. Exodus, that means where they were coming out of Egypt, bondage to the freedom, promised land. 21 reads, And the Lord went before them by the day in a pillar of a cloud. He was there, it was hot, and he cooled them with that very shade. Who was in the cloud? God went before them in a pillar of a cloud to lead them the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light to go by day and night. What does that say to you? Do you think God only is a part-time God? Yeah, it's four o'clock. I guess he went home. That's what Elijah said to the Baal priest whenever they couldn't get their God to start the fire on the altar. In the Hebrew, Elijah said, maybe your God took a potty break, you know, to get their attention, okay? So I said that's what the Hebrew states, okay? It's all he said in the English is, maybe your God took a break, okay? Now, 22. He took not away the pillar of the cloud by day, nor the pillar of fire by night from before the people. Do you think God doesn't care? I mean, uh, here he's leading them. Turn, turn on over to the 24th chapter of Exodus here. I'm going to pick it up with verse eight, 15. I want you to know we're covered with a great cloud of witnesses, truth, Facts that you have a deed to. Verse 15 of Exodus 24. And Moses went up into the mount with a cloud, and a cloud covered the mount. I, I mean, it might have even been a scary looking cloud to some. 16. And the glory of the Lord abode upon Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it six days. And the seventh day he called unto Moses out of the midst of the cloud. What is six symbolic of? It's, we're in the sixth dispensation now. The seventh is the millennium. And that cloud is going to stay a cloud to most people for those six dispensations. It doesn't have to to you. You can see through that cloud and feel that comfort. On the seventh day, it's going to come out to everyone, and he's going to speak, because Christ is returning. Every knee shall bow. 17. And the sight of the glory of the Lord was like devouring fire on the top of the mount in the eyes of the children of Israel. Now that ought to straighten them out. You think it did? Well, let's read on. 18. And Moses went into the midst of the cloud. He went in there. Would you? And got him up into the mount, and Moses was in the mount forty days and forty nights. And you know what happened while he was up there? With God doing all those things for them, you know what the majority did? 
all the riches that God had gotten for them in Egypt. I mean, gold, gold by the scads. And they took it and melted it down and made a golden calf and were practicing idol worship before Moses was gone 40 days. What does 40 mean in biblical numerics? Probation. They were on probation. They blew it. He came back down, God made, them, God made them grind up that golden calf and eat it. They wouldn't eat his word. They wouldn't believe it. So he made them eat the golden calf. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 17. In closing... Okay, that's the New Testament, of course. Matthew and 20, chapter 17, teachings of Jesus Christ. Chapter 17 reads, verse 1. And after six days, whoops, there's that number again. Isn't that exciting? Six days, Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John, his brother. He took three witnesses with him and bringeth them up into a high mountain, apart. Took them apart from the other apostles, disciples at this time, meaning students, too. And was transfigured, just whoop, there it goes, transfigured before them, and his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as the light. In other words, this was to document to him, them, that he would not stay in the grave, that he would conquer death, Oh, death, where is thy sting? Grave, where is thy victory? There is none. That God, your, your shepherd, is in control. You don't have anything to worry about, and you've got a deed to prove it. His raiment as white as the light. Three, and before there, and behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elias. That's Elijah for you, okay? Talking with him. Here are those that were mentioned even in that Hebrews chapter 11 as, to, as faith examples. All right, got it? Got two of them right with him. Uh, four. Then answered Peter and said unto Jesus, Lord, ho, 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 it is good for us to be here. I mean, he thought he was woke up in heaven. All right. I mean, it's good to be here. If thou wilt, let us make here... Three tabernacles, one for thee, one for Moses, and one for Elias. Make, let, let's get heaven kicked off in a big way. This is it. Well, you know, we all jump the gun sometimes, don't we? It was just to show him an example. So how did God handle this? Verse 5. While he yet spake, he wouldn't listen, he had to talk. While he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud over Shadowed. There the Greek even gives the description of the prime of the word. Covered over, shadowed over them. And behold, a voice out of the cloud which said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. Uh, oh, I wonder who that was. I hope nobody had to ask that. Okay, I really do. Now, there's some ministers today that do have to, all right? There are, there are some ministers that doubt the virgin birth even, you know, so we have to kind of, they listen to higher critics too much, and they've gotten so out of touch with common sense that they're not even sure that the sun comes up in the east, all right? But, but I love them. They're fine. But see, who was in the cloud? That's my point. Well, you know. It was our Father, for Jesus was what? The only begotten Son. He could only have one Father, and do you know something? You, in the spiritual sense, can only have one Father. There are a lot like to choose the spurious Father because of ignorance, if they're not careful as to who comes first, because they haven't read, but you're not going to. And you're going to stay true to the Father, and He can say the same thing about you. That's my child. Not my only begotten, certainly, but He is the Father of your soul. 
He brought your soul, yourself into being. Why? He wanted you. He wanted you or you sure wouldn't be here. Right? You wouldn't be in existence. Verse 6, And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their face and were sore afraid. Listen, you better get acquainted with these witnesses. We're coming up on a time when if you're not careful, you're going to get shocked. Because we're in that generation. Be prepared. Verse 7, And Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise, be not afraid. You know why? You don't have anything to be afraid of. Why? Because of that great, huge cloud of witnesses that have recorded before your very eyes exactly what shall transpire. As we just covered in that great book of Amos, I will do nothing except I have forewarned you through the prophets. I don't know. Have you read them? Then you won't have, you won't have anything to be afraid of because man only fears the unknown. When you know what's going to happen, then you're more apt to say, Hey, bring them on. Come on down. We're ready. All right? Well, make sure you are when you say that because it could happen for you. All right? What a cloud of witnesses. Do you realize faith, that hope, that deed for things unseen? I'm going to tell you the same thing. Just because you can't see them, if you listen real carefully, if sometimes if you're out in prayer in nature itself and you listen real carefully, you might hear them. You may not see them, but you're going to hear them. Just listen carefully. I'm not, re I'm not instructing you to do something outlandish or anything like that. I'm just making the point they are there. You can count on it. And he loves you. He's in control. These little old nations, as they pop around, and we have such honorable leaders at this time that some of them have trouble with things. But um, they used to, they had to worry, you know, like in wartime about keeping your lips zipped. <laughs> it would seem that lips are not what have to be careful to be zipped anymore be that as it may but God help us all but that is his word the witnesses oh what a cloud of them that hidden that covering they cover you that are there to support you when you will take the time to read their witness not a witness until you absorb it it's just a book but after you absorb it, it becomes real in your life. And it pleases your Father a lot. Okay, Father, we thank you, Father, for your written word. For that witness, Father. We know who the author is. We know who the finisher is. Take these and use them, Father. Let them be champions, Father, of the people as they take your word forth. Planting seeds, Father. Giving hope to the children that are so misled even at this time. We ask it in Yeshua, Jesus' precious name. Amen.